Hey, what's going on, everyone? Welcome back to the Long Gray Lesson Show. Today's guest is Major Jeremy White. Jeremy is a close friend and mentor who I met while as a cadet. He is a USMA grad and in the class of 2007. Jeremy spent his initial career at Fort Riley, Kansas with the 1st Infantry Division, serving as a scout platoon leader, a mortar platoon leader, and a tank company commander. Following that assignment, he served as an armor branch rep at West Point, where he taught and mentored cadets. Today, he is at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, where he's enrolled in Advanced Military Studies program as an Army strategist. On this podcast, we talk about scrambling both at West Point and in the military, balancing between family and country, and the importance of counting your blessings. No matter what people say that like, you know, one door closes, one door opens, Mm -hmm. another door might not open, but you gotta be happy with that, that room you're in, maybe. This is Jeremy White. Hey, thanks for tuning into the Long Gray Lesson Show. It's a podcast that motivates and inspires leaders to pursue their passions and to leave a positive impact in their communities. Welcome to the podcast, Jeremy. Uh, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. Uh, just, you know, a lot of reading. A lot of reading. Been up a lot lately. Sure. Been a lot of long nights of reading and then early morning waking up with the kids uh, or going and working out. And then, uh, so, but it's, it's, I've uh, been learning a lot. So it's been very, uh, beneficial this this year these last two years so it sounds like you're at west point all over again with without the kids or yeah actually that's funny because <laughs> they they call leavenworth college with kids oh okay. so because uh, it's because a lot of the guys you know people come back and they're they're going to education they're going to classes but classes don't usually last all day they're going to like 12 yeah and then you've got homework and stuff but especially when it's cgsc like last year it's it wasn't that uh the rigorous homework assignments and so there's a lot of you know beer pong and like oh, yeah. <laughs> cornhole going on in the streets sure and people like having parties and stuff so it's they call it college with kids that's so awesome because uh, everyone's you know most people have kids here and uh it's it was been a it's been a fun time in fact one of the best parts about it is meeting other people you know that are around here and i i, I moved in with a bunch of guys that were from west point or came from West Point just at the same time I did. Wow. So there was a tack down the street, and then across the way there was a, uh, a guy that worked in DMI. So I knew the guy that worked in DMI, and then didn't know him. But at least we had – oh, yeah, and, and then uh, the Bulls family, we knew them from West Point too because they were um, – but he worked in admissions. Mm-hmm. So there's four of us right here uh, all coming from West Point at the same time. So we all sort of knew each other and had some kind of like common commonality. Uh, which is different this year because none of the people that moved in came from came from West Point, right? Uh, so as instructors or tax or anything, so it's a, it's a whole new environment now. But it's cool because then I got to know the guy directly across from us, and he went he got into Sam's too. So Very cool. uh, he and I are, are buds now. So th- so there's a couple couple layers that I got out of that is one like the your coworkers from before at your previous job at West Point. They also moved here, so that goes along the lines of the army is pr- it's pretty small, wouldn't you say? It is. It's um, it's it's very small, and uh, it, I've run into just here, I've run into six guys um, that I didn't work with directly, but I recognized from units at Fort Riley when I was a lieutenant. Yeah. So like ten years ago. Uh, and then, oh yeah, and then classmates are all over the place here. Oh, sure. Mine. And in and, and Sam's with me now, and then especially in CGSE last year. Is, uh, so 10 years on uh, from graduating, and I'm running into all these dudes that are uh, never hadn't seen since. That's crazy. So, so what is it like when you guys like reconnect? Is it like, is it easy to catch up on? Has there, since there's been a lot of time that passed between you guys? Yeah, I mean, like, uh, especially, so there's one guy I guess really that I that was in my company that I knew pretty well, um, and he's in my seminar at at, at Sam's now, and so mm-hmm. um, yeah, it's it's pretty easy to get back into get in touch with them. But and also it's not it's one of the things about the army it, when you're moving around is that you're not 
you're not connecting with a, with people, at least in my case, I don't know other people, I can't speak to them, but at least for my case, you're not connected to people with, with people on like this deep level. Mm-hmm. Um, you get, you get to know the guy and stuff like that and it's great. Uh, but then you move and then four years later you move again and you see him again. Uh, and it's, it's cool. You know, you're, you're back on the same page, but it's not like I missed you oh, for yeah. 10 years, you know, even you could be my best friend, but like, I, or when I was, but I mean, right for me, I mean, I don't, I've, I moved around a lot as a kid too. Mm-hmm. So like, I never, I never really got to do a lot of like deep, uh, friend relationships and stuff like that. Yeah. Like Sarah, 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 she lived in the same small town, like her entire childhood. And so she's got friends that, in fact, one just came this weekend uh that she's known since she was in kindergarten oh wow yeah, so like we were in their wedding and stuff so uh it may be a particular thing of mine but i've met other people that feel the same way that just like you meet people you get to know them pretty pretty well right and then you never speak to them again for like eight years and you see them again and then you're like hey how you doing what's what's going on you that's know? crazy so, um but there are like so it's like it's like uh fast paced get to know somebody like pretty 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 well and then like you don't see them for like five or six years and you see them again that happens uh a lot i guess it seems like that's like a really unique trait that that's within the army profession is that there's constant turnover as far as and you're always rotating out of different to different assignments you're constantly meeting new people your family's really locating they're meeting new people as well Mm -hmm. and so do you think that's by design that they do that? Um, I mean, yeah, it is by design that the army, the army does move people around by design for uh, experience wise to get abroad, especially your officers. Mm-hmm. So I, I've thought about it before and I was like, man, I, you know, when I became a platoon leader, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't feel like I didn't feel that ready. Uh, by the time I had, done my you know by the end of my second platoon time so it was like two or three years in the army i was like i got this you yeah know, but i'm just about to get promoted to captain sure and then i'm like they're like okay now you gotta work in staff and i'm like but i just got this i felt like I, ju- I just now understand um and then i became a company commander uh and it was like so i was in command for 16 months and then my 16th month i was like i, I, I got this I, I figured this out like I'm, I'm figuring this out and they're like okay you're done with that you got to move on you got to do something else so and I've always, and I was like, man, it feels like you you just get some kind of learn, you know, some, some kind of um, like ex- growth, right? Yeah, you, you you finally figure out you figure out what you're doing in that yeah. job, and the army's like, nope, all right, next job, um, and that's by design because you can't you can't grow a general by a guy sitting a guy as a company commander for ten years. Mm-hmm. So like, every officer that comes into the army has potential to get, get, get become a general. Sure, but if you spend you know, half your career as a, as a platoon leader, uh, when you're going to learn to be, you know, the battalion S3, you know, because you got you got to do all these different levels of command, see all these different things. Um, and so you'll never be able to become an expert in any field. Sure. Or any job uh, or any level of command until you get up to like colonel rank. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then people sit not in the same exact job, but they become a little bit more specialized. And then you have the the functional areas that you know, people move into, and they become sort of experts. You still move around a lot, and that's also by design. But it's that's really interesting. Um, that actually makes me think a lot about like like how West Point's set up, where you're essentially put into a bunch of different subjects, classes. Um, even if you're like have one field of study, and that's to get you that wide breadth of knowledge, experience. And also discomfort, because I think a lot of what you're getting to is typically by the point where you actually start to get something in concrete as far as knowledge and you know what you're doing, they move you right away. Yeah. And that, that already speaks to maybe academia in general and uh, liberal education. Um, mm-hmm. So you, you want people to have a broad base of education, especially officers uh, in the army. Um, you get that broad base of education. Uh, you're able to think in different ways, but you're not an expert really in almost anything. Even if even become an undergraduate major, um, you're still not really that big of an expert. And maybe you think you are, um, but uh, that's by design again to get someone a broad understanding of of 
the world or of the education. Yeah. Uh, and there, there's people that complain about that. I've, I've seen that, you know, why am I paying, but this is civilian obviously, but why am I paying all this money, you know, to get a business degree when, and I have to go take, you know, two art programs. Sure. Like that. Or the but generals, you know? Yeah. It's so, yeah. So you're just, it's a, uh, it, it's maybe it's a holdover. I don't know, but it's, it's an understanding that uh, having a broad base of understanding on, on, on lots of different things is a mark, mark of an educated person mm -hmm. that you have some knowledge um in lots of different fields sure and you know that, that's what the army does in a lot of ways to to get you uh, understanding what it is to be a company commander what it is to be a lieutenant uh at west point they move you in even in your companies you know maybe not, maybe you didn't right uh, but when i was there yeah scrambled us scrambling they, yeah that comes in and out of vogue what what is what is scrambling for those who don't oh yeah so um when I came in as a freshman or a plebe, I uh, I was in the company C3 and uh, spent one year there. And then when I became an upperclassman, so mm -hmm. I was moving into being a sophomore, uh, your yearling, uh, they, that was the move period for my class where I moved into another company, another group of people, completely different. Mm -hmm. And then those people that I moved in with would be my company mates for the next three years okay and the same and the people that were there before me had been there together with those guys for three years um and i think the benefit to that was you you make mistakes as a as a plebe you make uh you do dumb things uh, and it's kind of encouraged to do dumb things it's just to kind of <laughs> kind of get it out of your system sure um but and then you screw up a lot sometimes and you don't want or this is maybe the idea that you don't want to be stuck with the same stigmas about the same typifications of, on what what you do or what what you, what you're about mm -hmm. uh, that you came in with because because you did come in you know as a as a from high school off the street and you come in you know you're through beast but your socialization hasn't hasn't completed yet yeah because uh, beast is what like six weeks mm -hmm. something six like that weeks, so, yeah. so then there's another year where you're still socializing you're still that person maybe that you came you came from high school being um and maybe that kind of person's not what the army wants or what west point wants so hopefully by the end of your plea year you've you've reached a level of social socialization that you've started to get some of the values that, that west point wants you to have uh so you've gotten some of that out of your system by the time you reach your sophomore year and then you're you know, with a new group of people that didn't know all the you know idiosyncrasies that you had from before uh, and maybe so that that's how the system works when i was there it, it's different it comes and goes i mean i think some classes didn't scramble at all right. and people say they love that uh and then here recently which was the, the ire of a lot of cadets right as i was leaving they had made the decision to scramble um not not scramble you until your junior year going oh, wow. into your senior year midway through so oh third, third third okay. of the way through or two three three, three quarters, quarters of the way through <laughs> going into your senior year got to know all these guys you know you're really close then they scramble you into a new company and that was to replicate you walking in to your first platoon uh the people there don't know you mm. never seen you before and now you're walking in as a uh and you're in charge and that's so the cadet officers coming into a new new company nobody there is supposed to ostensibly knows you uh and you know you have the maybe the more more power to change things because you don't have maybe some kind of stigma you built up over three years of being mm -hmm. their bros uh and now you're you're re you can really enact some change um wow. there were some problems with that too because then you get into like cadet culture sure and then like what am i Absolutely. so it's like so when I go back to West Point, I, I'm G3. I was a gopher. Yeah. I'm a gopher, you know? For life. Well, who am I <laughs> if I was G3 for only one year at the end? Yeah. Because I don't go around saying I was in C3. I'm not a fighting cock or whatever. Sure. Which I don't think are no coyotes. Yeah. Uh, but I don't go around telling people that because that was just one year. Right. And so now, but that's the last company I was with. But it's also the company I spent the least amount of time with. How do you build up loyalty like that, you know? <laughs> yeah. So there's, there's some... Uh, so I don't know. It goes back and forth, but whether or not, and then that goes to say also with the moving in the army too. So how do you build up loyalty? Mm -hmm. But should you build up loyalty? How deep should your loyalty go to that unit? 
And where is the loyalty really supposed to be? And it's supposed to be to the army. And that your your unit, it gets your loyalty mm -hmm. for a time. But that but if you stayed in that unit for fifteen years or sure. whatever, uh, you may get too attached to it. And, oh yeah. And view yourself uh, as something uh, that you're not you shouldn't be viewing yourself as you should be viewing yourself as something as part of a system mm. and not part of this unit like so. an, uh, an unbiased professional yeah yeah um, yeah so your loyalty is to the system sure and not to the unit that's interesting and I guess like these thoughts you know like just thinking about how the system operates why it is the way it is it doesn't just happen overnight you don't just suddenly realize like, oh, this is why it's, it's by design. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and, and it's funny, we were talking about, you know, the socialization uh, of reality. Sure. Uh, and, and reification. I don't know how far we want to go into that. But uh, uh, so you, you think that maybe this is always how it's been. But obviously, this was created. Some mm -hmm. guy at some point in the army decided, or maybe not guy, but maybe a board of people probably decided that like, uh, because we didn't do this always it used to be that we had a regimental system mm -hmm. and you came up in that regiment and then you only moved out of that regiment every once in a while. And that's how some military still do. Um, I think a lot of do actually. Uh, uh, but they decided that that wasn't going to be good because you get too much, too loyal to attach that unit. Maybe you'll turn down promotions and stuff yeah. like that. Cause you want to stay in your, stay with your guys. Right. Uh, when the army needs maybe your talent somewhere else and your loyalty is not in the right spot in that way. So, uh, and it took takes a while to figure that out mm -hmm. on the, on the individual level to to figure out why I'm moving. It wasn't much of a problem for me. Like I said, I moved around a little bit in my yeah. childhood, so it wasn't. Uh, in fact, when uh, I, I've become so accustomed to it that it would be completely strange to decide I was going to live in one place for a long time. I, right, because I considered getting out of the army for a little bit. Okay. Um, at the ten year mark, or just before the ten year mark. Really. Where are you right now? Um, I'm past it. I'm like um, oh seven, right? Eleven? Eleven years, yeah. Yeah, I'm at eleven years now. Um, but yeah. Uh, so I thought about getting out of the thing around year nine, and I thought about joining the FBI, and because let's, it was, let's I, talk more about that. Yeah. Okay. yeah. What, what got you moving in that direction? So I had done, so I, I really loved being an armor officer. Uh, I, I had been a scout platoon leader, mortar platoon leader. I've done some time on staff. I was a company tank, company commander. Mm -hmm. And I had a great time. I loved every bit of all that stuff. Uh, I loved the culture of armor. I loved uh, kind of the esprit de corps. And it's interesting, you'll find, I think, and you can talk to other branches too, and they might tell you too, but armor officers in general, really love being armor officers sure uh death before dismount a little bit yeah but a, a little <laughs> bit more than maybe some other branches love their branch like you can hardly find any guy that'll speak bad about yeah uh, about armor uh but it's so the culture there is fun um but you know i looked out to the future and i never really pictured myself in the army past company command really the past eight years i was like i don't even know what is going to happen here Mm -hmm. never really considered it till about like year seven um but i was married now i had two kids and i was thinking well i, you know, I could stay in and uh i could be an s3 i could work at but you know, they work they're worth their tails off mm -hmm. uh, but i kind of found out later that all majors work their tail off it doesn't matter where you're at uh but they're all fighting for that next job which is battalion command and then only a fraction of them get it yeah. even if they're if they're really good uh, only a fraction of them really get it and then in battalion command i never thought that was like that cool of a job i, I personally wasn't really my motivation so i was like well maybe i could do something do something else do a different thing i like service i don't feel like i could do much uh else with my life except serve something uh just didn't interest me anything else so i thought the fbi would be a good role mm -hmm. for me to go pursue and then I could, I could also be the guy that does things for once instead of the guy that tells other people to go do things um which was it really um really spoke to me in that way 
but I started looking like the for one the benefits, uh, the pay scale, hmm. insurance, you know, things these things that I had never had to even consider in the army. It's one of those huge benefits of the army. And then I looked into like, you know, there's 52 field offices in the United States. And usually when you graduate from Quantico, they send you to one of those major field offices. Uh, you don't usually go to one of like the sub offices, satellite, mm-hmm. satellite offices. You go to, so you go to one of those major field offices. And then their, their institution is, is set up so that uh, you don't move much. You know, to, to move, you have to like request to move. And then it goes by seniority hmm. on how you, on whether or not you can move, depending on where you want to go. If you want to go somewhere undesirable, then it's easier. But if you want to go somewhere that everybody else wants to go, then, you it's know, competition. It may be. It's kind of like the military, right? Yeah, but the military, you move. If you don't like your job in the right. army, you got to stick it out for three or four years and you're gone. You're somewhere else completely yeah. different. Uh, there, I mean, you could spend eight to 10 years. Oh, it's like indefinite. In, yeah, yeah, doing that job at that wow. place with those people with no hope of moving to the place you want to go uh, for eight, you know, eight, eight to 10 years. And then, and then you live in the same house. <laughs> oh, my goodness. You live in the same house, same place. For eight to ten years, and that just blew my mind. And I was like, "Man, I, I don't." I, that's I don't a gamble. That. Yeah, that's a gamble. I want to be. I want to. I want to leave. I want to move. Mm-hmm. I want to. I want to keep going. Uh, I can't sit in one spot yeah. anymore. I, I don't. I, I couldn't. So like, I can't even think about like living in the same house. Yeah. For more than a few years, it right? Freaks me out because you're so used. Yeah, to I'm that. so used to it. So, since growing up, since growing up, and yeah. also being in the army, it's just. Um, I was like. Wow, I mean, the air conditioner went off. I think that's but oh yeah, it sounds so much change, better. <laughs> major changes, <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, we, uh, so yeah, so that was one of the major things. I was like, man, I can't. Uh, it seems so crazy, but it, I was still on track. But then it, it occurred to me is like, man, do you do you not like the army? I was like, no, I, I like the army still. I, I just the path I'm on, maybe I just I don't really have a lot of excitement for it anymore i mean i love being in armor i love being in tanks but I, i'm not going to be on a tank i'm going to be on staff uh for the next six years six seven years and then maybe i'll get battalion command maybe not so i was i was looking at it and then i decided you know it's not the army that i don't like it's just this path and mm-hmm. there's other and then i didn't really know that early on but there are lots of paths you can take to get out and you you know that you mm-hmm. know you know that early on i didn't really know that and I decided, you know, it's, I want to stay in, I think it's just, I want to do something else. And so I put in for functional area. Okay. And so I went into a, uh, now I'm an FA 59. I'm a, I'm an army strategist. I haven't done any strategist stuff yet, but, uh, I'm on that. I'm in that, I'm in that, that area. And it, it sounds a lot cooler or it, it sounds cool for like the future. Sure. Yeah. And also sets me up a little bit for, for me, for one day when I actually do retire. Uh, that I'll have maybe some some kind of skill that somebody will want. Yeah, you know, beyond maybe a uh, you know, be a tank company commander or tank battalion commander, which I'm sure there's lots of opportunities for people. But so army strategist, what 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 does that exactly entail? Like, is that grand strategy, bigger, higher level planning for like a division? So or so so I guess. To talk about that, maybe we need to talk about the different levels of war. Yeah. Uh, just for a second. Uh, so there's a tactical level of war, mm. which is the engagement. This is the the people fighting, um, using formations and the actual shooting of people at each other. And then above that is the operational level of war, which is a little bit amorphous and doesn't really it's hard it's hard to find in some ways. But it's all these things that get that unit or get that engagement to happen um, from like the ports to the you know the lines of communications to the arraignment of forces across the theater um that all kind of is where op- the operational level of war and that is a is above division so in, in our army the, the highest tactical element is the division and then above that is core and the core is supposed to be in the operational level of war all the way up to like theater army and then str- strategy develops the ends the end states for um what they what what the policy makers and what um the government wants you to do that's strategy they so it's uh, setting up 
the goals basically for uh, for the war mm. or for anything you know mm -hmm. so it's not maybe not just war strategy doesn't just happen in war but mm -hmm. it's there's always some opponent that you're trying to get a an advantage over mm. and that is your strategy to come up with some kind of objective to do it and the military is just one uh, element one element of national power uh, that that can be used can be applied to achieve those goals and so with ends ways and means and the risk involved in in that way uh, the strategist is the guy that tries to connect the the the, the plan the planning or the what the army's doing with the policy objectives of the you know, the government or gotcha. you know it, in a in a large theater um so like ucom uh they have their own say they, they kind of have a small role of strategy so it's again it's also amorphous it's not really mm -hmm. well defined in some in some way so because there's theater strategy sure which is like is that operations is that really strategy i'm not so it's it goes back and forth on that but the strategist lives above division is the lowest level you, I could be at yep. the division staff. There's like one or two, I think at that staff and then at commands and then other offices above that working on policy and also planning. Um, but always at a higher level of, um, uh, so lower level of detail, higher level, like conception, hmm. uh, coming up with plans on how to get at, how to solve a problem complex problem so it's something what sam's sam's people do as well but it's but they're but it's more focused on the operational level and the strategist is focused more on the strategic level gotcha well th thank you for explaining that because that to me i've always wondered like what in the heck does a grand strategist do so, so yeah so grand strategy is also a kind of a hot button word that's a what is grand strategy and grand strategy may be like what the president does you know sure. what, what the the highest levels of office do yeah and then strategy is like lower than that it's for, it's, gotcha it's it's for confusion of terms here and there that's really cool does this move further like let's say when you decide to get out will you have like a government position um something that falls along those lines uh potentially i haven't done a, a ton of research in it mm -hmm. and I, I said i haven't really done any strategist work so if there's like real strategists out there like listening in and they're like, that dude doesn't know what he's doing. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Uh, I, I only know what I, I think I know. Um, but from what I've, I kind of understand, right, that there's you know think tanks mm -hmm. um, that deal with future problems sure. and write papers. And, and that's something I like to do. I like to write or I like, I've always had like a, an affinity for writing. So that's one of the reasons that I went for strategists because it has, uh, strong you need for uh, or a need for strong writers there's a lot of writing and thinking on complex issues and so i felt like something i, I would like to do uh, but yeah so like there are a few there are organizations that employ think think tanks and people to think in their think tanks and a lot of that has to do with strategy gotcha. uh, for the, but it, it's not all government mm -hmm. a lot of it's private private enterprise that are, are being maybe probably funded by government or hoping to get a contract or uh, just going back on some of the things that you said you said you traveled a lot uh, as a kid and uh, like were you a military brat or I wasn't um, so my parents had me when they were 16 years old so we were so my parents were still in high school mm -hmm. when I was born so my dad graduated and then we stayed in Waynesboro for one more year I believe w Waynesboro, Mississippi. Waynesboro, Mississippi. Yeah. Okay. So, it, um, for one more year, they both finished high school. We didn't come from very, you know, a affluent families either. So, I mean, we had it. It was rough, uh, as I remember when I was a very young child. Uh, but then my dad started going to junior college at Jones Junior College. Uh, he did two years there, and then we moved. Uh, I was maybe four. I don't know. I don't, I don't know really three or four to, uh, to Starksville, Mississippi. Um, and that's where my dad went to college to get his engineer degree in civil engineering. He worked really hard there. My mom had a job. He had night jobs, uh, stayed there for three years to finish his degree there. And then we moved to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, Excuse me. um, where he had his first job 
and we lived in Baton Rouge for just a couple of years. And then we moved kind of in the suburbs. And then I stayed there uh, for about six years. Mm-hmm. And then I moved. And then uh, he became like the project engineer, the head project engineer of this Baton Rouge office. And uh, he was like the youngest engineer in the state in charge of the most expensive projects in the state. Wow. So it was kind of, it was, it was burning him out. Yeah. And uh, so we wanted to keep, so my parents wanted to get back to something a little more, uh, you know, slower paced. Sure. So there was an opening actually back in Waynesboro, Mississippi, uh, back in Wayne County. So that we moved, so we moved back uh, the tail end of my eighth grade year. So I spent like maybe a couple months in eighth grade in Waynesboro and then all high school in Waynesboro. Mm-hmm. So I, I moved around, you know, not, you know, like every two years, but I moved around a little bit, a little bit more than typical yeah. uh, for kids. And so I never had any, like I said before, high school, you know, like kids, you know, people that I knew for a very long time. So yeah. I guess it kind of set me up for, you know, living this kind of lifestyle sure. in that way. But it wasn't a military. It wasn't in the military. So I, nobody in my family has been in the military except my grandpa did. Uh, he was in the Navy for, mm-hmm. for a few years. But I guess we never really talk about that much because I I barely knew that um, for, for, mo- for most of my childhood. So it, that wasn't really anything that inspired me to join the Army or anything. So, so it's not like I'm not like a uh, a legacy. In yeah. So so how, so I, I mean I've talked to a lot of classmates. You know, I'm sure you have as well. They, they do have that legacy. They have that legacy of every single generation. Someone's in the military or someone that went to West Point. How did you even hear about that and get to that point? Yeah. So West Point to me, I didn't even know that was a thing until I think uh, into my sophomore year of high school. I didn't, never even heard of West Point my whole life. Um, so the reason I wanted to join the Army is that uh, I always felt and it was probably the popular culture that I was into. But mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I loved Top Gun, Rambo, uh, Hulk Hogan. Oh yeah, Hulk uh, Hogan so, for sure. So all, that, <laughs> so all that stuff is like you know playing America, on my childhood. Right. So America to me, and this is you know this is the, the late eighties. I'm starting to get socialized in that way, and then <laughs> the early nineties. So I, I'm like, I love, I love America. Yeah, and I still do. But I, I'm just like at the time, I was just like, America's the greatest country of all time, and you know. It, it needs people to, to defend it or it needs, it needs people that to, to do it. So like uh, soldier was always in my mind, but I always had like another job too. So I was like, I'm going to be a soldier and a professional wrestler. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to be a soldier and you know, some other job. Yeah. So I always had that. So then it became like, came into high school and I was like, so my dad was like, what are you going to do when you got out of high school? It's like, well, I'm going to join the army, I guess. And my dad was like, okay. Uh, well, you want to go to college? I was like, yeah, yeah. And then it was like, okay, so that means you want to be an officer. I was like, I guess, whatever that is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. like a police officer. Yeah, yeah. Well, I just knew that. <laughs> I just knew I didn't want to be in the army. Right. But I also knew I wanted to go to college, so that kind of meant that. I, oh, okay, you need to be an officer. So okay, cool. I need to be an officer, whatever that is. And uh, so I decided, okay, I want to be an officer. And then it was like tail end of my sophomore year, and I'm pretty sure my dad didn't know anything about it. Maybe he got like a flyer from somewhere. Yeah. Uh, but he was like, so you you want to go to the army? I was like, yeah. You want to be an officer? Yeah. That you want to then maybe you should go to a school that what they do is make army officers like the best army officers. And there's a school called West Point. And that's all they do. And I was like, okay, I guess I need to go there. So <laughs> so that's that's where so it was like junior year of high school. I started working toward doing that. Yeah. And started learning about the process and started uh, to to get into it and taking taking all the standardized tests and making sure i was in student government stuff like that so if you want to talk about that like what i what i so what i knew i needed to do Mm -hmm. uh, maybe for people that are listening i wanted to talk that were thinking about that so uh at the time i i got good grades i was a good student um so it wasn't that wasn't going to be hard for me to keep that up Mm -hmm. Uh, so i was i was doing good in school so check so gotta get gotta get good grades uh sports it's also a big deal what people that are doing athletic things, whole person kind of concept. Uh, so I was, I was already doing that. I was doing football. Uh, I was doing karate. I, I, I could have done other sports, but like football was so big in my sure. high school that like, basically that was the only sport you do. Yeah. Um, so I was doing football. I was doing, I was doing karate. Uh, I was, I was pretty, I was being an athlete to check. So then there are other things that you can do to, to help yourself. Um, 
I went to Mississippi Governor's School, which mm-hmm. is a summer program that does that takes people that scored above a certain on their ACT um, to get into this program. They give you a college credit or something. I didn't do it for that. I did it so I could put it on a resume to go to West Point and say, hey, look, I'm doing stuff that's more academic, sure. and more stuff. Uh, I took my ACT like five or six times. Five or six times. <laughs> yeah, I did it. I, I remember taking one like literally right after a football game. The oh, my next goodness. day I drove. Um, we did a football game. I drove through the night to a to the testing site, slept in a hotel with my with my dad, uh, and then I went to the took the ACT the wow. next morning. So I so I was just I just had to get a higher score. Um, I, I was doing I got a thirty six in, in reading on my first try. That's crazy. But then like my math score was was pretty low, which is weird because I thought I was really good at math, <laughs> which will play into a future. Right, episode. right. I thought I was really good at math because uh, in Mississippi public education i was doing really great at, right in math class um but i'm working really hard to get my i can finally get my math up and i've got a decent score to submit that so standardized testing sct act check and then i started getting into student government uh i was in youth my youth group i was mm-hmm. active in the youth group that was mainly just personally me but the student government stuff i hated but i had to do it yeah because <laughs> i wanted to show that i was more active in my community and stuff like that. Extracurriculars, yeah. leadership. Um, and there's, there's, so there's other, yeah, leadership stuff. So there's other things that I could have been doing like Eagle Scout. Yeah. It looks really good on a oh, resume. Sure. So if you're, if you got your kid and you, and, and you're thinking about one day making them, you know, seeing if you can get into the military academy, uh, get, get him in the Boy Scouts Yeah, or get girls that can go in the, in the Scouts. So getting that Eagle Scout moniker is apparently a, a big check on the, on, on the resume. Um, so all that went in together and then I had to get a congressman's letter of recommendation as well. Mm-hmm. I applied for early action to West Point my senior year. Oh yeah, I was an ROTC too. Oh, J- you're an ROTC J- too? JROTC. Oh, JROTC. Yeah. Okay. So I was a company commander. Oh, does that help? Company. Does that help at all? At all I think it does. Uh, I mean, it was on my resume. I put it in the thing. Right. And I wrote an essay and stuff. But um, I couldn't get too much involved with that because it, it conflicted with football. Oh, okay. So I couldn't take too many electives in that way. Uh, and then I also took some AP classes too. So all, all that kind of goes in. You're so busy. Like, how did you have time yeah. for anything? Well, yeah. I didn't party. I didn't have a social life really in high school. Yeah. Uh, which something has to give, right? Yeah. Something well, I, I mean, I didn't. I didn't know what I was missing because I never, <laughs> I never really partied in high school and stuff. Uh, so then, which made West Point easier, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. So then they train you for that four years. Yeah. Then I. <laughs> yeah. And then they let you out in the world. Yeah. And then, yeah, you, you, you light your hair on fire. But anyway, I, so I, um, so my senior year, I applied for early action. I don't know if that's still a program or not, but it's basically, you can get, if you commit basically to West Point or say you commit to West Point, I don't know if it's like a contract or anything. But if you say that, if you give me an offer, I'll, I'm coming to West Point, to West Point, they'll, they'll consider you early. Okay. Before. This was when it was rolling admissions, I'm yeah. assuming. Yeah. Okay. They'll consider you early and say, say whether or not they're going to take you. Uh, I didn't have a letter of recommendation yet from a congressman, but I applied for early action and I got back. Yeah, you know, we've looked at your file and you know you're good. So if if you can get a letter of recommendation from a congressman, then then we'll take you. Mm-hmm. And so I took that to my congressman. It was like, look, they're going to take me. You know, I just need your thing. And he was like, oh yeah, there you go. Oh, wow. And so. <laughs> Uh, so I kind of went in a little bit different order yeah. than I think most people do. Most people like work for that nomination and then hope they get accepted. I got accepted early. Do they still uh, do that? I, I don't, don't know. I haven't I, heard of that. I, I have not didn't either. I don't know if most people don't even know that, that was a thing. I just remember going to Academy days. I went to so many Academy days too. Is you that know, kind of like a like? initial uh, look so, at West Point? It's, so all the congressmen, uh, Congress people do it. Um, so like admissions, I think, mm-hmm. send people to these things all over the country. Okay. And Congressman will get together and his constituents and you go to their academy day and you meet people from admissions from the different service academies. It's all service academy oriented. Mm-hmm. And you learn about the service academy and you get FaceTime with the, the congressperson and say, hey, look, right on. looking for your recommendation. So I went to my congressman's thing. I went to another congressman's thing. I went to a senator's thing. Yeah. I went to my congressman several times, uh, academy days basically every time they were having one and it was in driving distance i went to one they, so they knew you at that point oh yeah like the i can't say really my congressman knew me 
too much. I mean, he's a busy dude. But, but he's familiar. But he has a representative yeah. that is his representative for like, service academy people. Okay. And they knew me very well. Uh, so Steve Guyton was the guy for Chip Pickering. Uh, and he was kind of the, the head dude for the state. Mm-hmm. And he's an, he's an insane person. But he knew my name. <laughs> so <laughs> That's good. I, I'm sure that, that helps me out in some ways. And then, uh, uh, so yeah, so I, so I came... So I, I had known about the Academy in that way. And I think that's how I learned about early action is like maybe the Academy representative there told me about it. And so I, I put in my application for that and, and uh, I got accepted early and I kind of decided that's it. I also had a scholarship to go to Mississippi state hmm. at the same time. I worked a, another scholarship through the RTC program in Mississippi state and, and I got accepted for a full ride scholarship. So for, four years as long as I stayed in the RC program. Right. I, I'd have a full scholarship to go to, to Mississippi state. Uh, all expenses paid to Mississippi state. That would have been a completely different experience. I know. <laughs> uh, but I had to call that guy uh, after I got accepted. Oh yeah. It was also, I got the letter of acceptance the day after we won the state championships in football. Oh wow. So like I won the state championships on like Friday night, Saturday morning. We get the, we get the letter saying I got accepted. Uh, so you called was, Mississippi was, right after that. That was a big, that was a big day, big weekend for my family. Wow. But yeah, the next, so the next, the next week, I call the the guy, Mr. State, and I, I turned it down. He's like, I understand. West Point's a big deal. You should, you know, you should take that. Um, but yeah, I did. I definitely was laying in my bed uh, during <laughs> during basic during Beast and thinking it's like the second third night. I was like, what am I doing? What am I doing? <laughs> I had I had a full ride scholarship. Mississippi State, and now I'm not. I, I think we all State. have those thoughts, like the second or third night in, and yeah. they're and they're it, pounding on your door. It was definitely like the second or third night. The first night wasn't. I I was like I was too overwhelmed to even think. I oh, just yeah. laid down and went to sleep. But it was like the second or third night. I started actually reflecting on what I'm doing right now, and I'm like, wow, what have you done? Yeah, and and so do you think, um, you know, as time progressed throughout Beast time at west point you kind of just you kind of understood like this is this is the, a new lifestyle yeah you know? yeah i mean i had that i, mean, I, knew, I kind of knew what i was getting into i watched like a video on it stuff uh, <laughs> I, i'd seen you don't watch any of my videos did you no no you were, <laughs> you were how old were you when i was you know, was, i'm just kidding no it was, it was back when i was watched this uh, surviving west point it was, it was, a, it was, it was like a it was like a documentary right? or something like that of yeah. west point and there was like a documentary about people going through and uh, I'd watched a couple episodes of that. And so I had an idea on what was happening. Not that great of an idea. And I've seen movies and they go through basic training and stuff. It's all platoon. Right. So it's gotta be something to do like that. <laughs> and I mean, it wasn't exactly, but full metal jacket. Yeah. Yeah. Full metal jacket's what I meant. But, uh, so I had an idea of what, what the army was going to be, Yeah. but I, I knew that that's what I wanted to do. I, I wanted to be in the army. I wanted to serve, the, I want to serve the nation. I felt like, I felt like that's what a person should do. Mm-hmm. You know, this is a should thing. This is something I ought to do. And, um, and I was going to do it. And that's all, that was the only motivation I had really going to West Point. Uh, people told me that like, Oh, you get a good job or like it's good education or to me, I mean, Oh, Mississippi State's good in education too. I, I mean, I, yeah, I think West Point's at another level, but now, <laughs> but at the time, I was like, oh, Mississippi State, it's a great school, uh, which it is. But you know, I think West Point, we could all say, is better uh, of an education in certain ways. Um, but so, to me, the only reason I was there is because I wanted to be an army, and I want I wanted to be an officer, and I wanted to be the best one I could be. Now. Um, I didn't always have the best attitude while I was there. Uh, Those cynical yucks. Yeah, I was. Yeah, I was. Uh, I was cynical sometimes, and you know, I didn't really buy into the system sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So I wasn't the best cadet, I don't think. But that's. I wasn't try. I wasn't there to be the best cadet. I was mm-hmm. there because I wanted to serve in the military, and I didn't really have any aspirations to be a general, or, or anything. I just I wanted to do some time serving the nation because I felt like that's what the nation deserved for me or that's what I owed it. I owed the nation this because I owed, you know, all the freedoms that I've been given and stuff like that. That was kind of a, uh, my mentality going in, which surprised me was not a common mentality. I felt like a lot of people 
we're there for different for you know for legacy reasons yeah for educational reasons for yeah. job opportunities and stuff like that or you know um sports so, you know yeah you know, sports and i yeah. was so confused when i got there and i heard people's because re- i think where we sat down and like within the first couple of weeks and like a big in the drafting rooms and like some officer i don't remember who he was and just asked us and was like go around the room just tell us why you're here stuff like that and i got i was the last guy and nobody said that they want they just want to join the army like serve the country and stuff so i'm like the last guy and i'm like i joined the army. i came to west point because i wanted to be an officer and i wanted to, to serve the nation and i felt like such a cheese ball in this room i was like oh god that was the they, cheesiest answer ever they didn't grow up loving hulk hogan like you did though. no hulk hogan is definitely <laughs> definitely drove a lot of what who i am today i'd be a lot different person if i was not a hulkamaniac at the yeah. same time so so what you're t- just to elaborate more on that is service means a lot to you right that, that's why you're still also in the military you're still serving your country what what after all these years you know, at West Point as an army officer, what, what does service mean to you? Service to, to something bigger than, than myself is, is something that I always felt passionate about. Like, I don't feel like I could do a business job where I'm working for a company and maybe, you know, I'm doing good things for the world. Uh, but I wouldn't, I don't know if I would feel like that I'm serving a higher cause. Mm-hmm. And if I wasn't in the military, I would probably be doing something else in that field and service is is sacrifice it is being able to give of yourself to something that you believe is more important than you and more important than you know your your comfort or or your you know um or your life in in a lot of ways sometimes uh so that's what i felt i felt i feel this i feel a desire that a life not in service is a life wasted. Like I'm not doing something that is, that is giving to something that's bigger than me. So if I, if I was living a life, not of service, I'd be living for myself. And that just feels selfish to me. Mm-hmm. I, I feel like, or even, even, you know, even my family, you know, that's a, it's still me. It's still my, my people. It's not a life serve for something greater. Yeah. And, and and that's just my opinion. And, and there's a lot of, I mean, I, I completely can relate to that. Yeah. Um, and I feel like there's a lot of sacrifice that goes into that, you know? Yeah. Including, you know, your family. You know, you you say you constantly move around all the time. Your family is also traveling with you. Yeah. And, and I don't want to say that, that that I personally have, have had to sacrifice much because mm-hmm. uh, I haven't. Uh, there's lots of people out there. And when you meet people um, or you meet family members of people who've lost or, you know, I haven't lost anyone in my, in my command, but I've talked to people that have, have, and you know, you've got to go back now to a place and there's a family there that doesn't have their person anymore. And they gave that, that last, you know, bit of sacrifice or that last, you know, measure for the country. And so I haven't had to do that. I haven't even had to have the moral sacrifice of losing someone in my in my command mm-hmm. uh i haven't haven't deployed a lot um so there's there, there's not much that i've had to sacrifice in my opinion right so there's i may have sacrificed more than 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 other people in in the in the, in the world I've, I've spent a lot of times away from my family uh but there's people that have given way more than i have and and they're still doing it and they're still waking up and going to PT and, 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 and doing the job. So if they can do it and they've given way more than I have, then what, you know, how, how can I complain about, about my lot in life? Sure. And does that continue to push yourself, motivate yourself to keep going, you know, with all these obstacles that you probably are facing along the way? Yeah. I mean, it, it does. I mean, it's at, at, at this point it's come, it's become more of a lifestyle though. So it's mm-hmm. not even a choice or it's not like something I think about a whole lot. Sure. It's, uh, you know, I'm, pa- I'm past 10 years, you know, it's kind of be kind of crazy for me to get out at this point and over the in hump. a lot of ways over the hump, halfway to retirement, you know, and I always thought that, well, at first I always thought it was only eight years and I'm going to get out and then I'm going to be an actor, a stunt man, a pro wrestler, 
pro wrestler. Uh, I had a lot of weird, weird. Uh, I still, still want to be a pro wrestler. When I was real young, I really liked Hulk Hogan. I liked pro wrestling. Uh, I didn't even really watch it much, but I, I saw commercials and I saw I had like posters, and I just really liked it. And I thought it was, I thought it was so cool. And, um, and then when uh, then I, I stopped watching it for, a, or stopped even paying attention to it for a long time. And then it was about middle school. Uh, I started watching WCW because Hulk, Hulk Hogan had come basically come back and was now a bad guy. Yeah, yeah. But I still loved him, and, and so I started watching again. I got really into it, and then I got out of it basically when I started going to high school. And then I was I was I was out of it for like ten years almost, and then it was about like three or four years ago I started like getting back. It's like it. WWE now, right? Yeah, W. So I switched over. So there's two big brands. It was WCW and WWF, and now WCW is gone, and WWF turns their name to WWE, but. uh so you, so you still know about it? Yeah, so I, still, <laughs> I still know about it. I know I, 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 more than I did even when I was in high, uh, middle school. But yeah, so there's always a, there was always part of me that was like, man, I, I wish I could do that because like I may have I mentioned just for a moment that I wanted to be an actor. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's what I thought I was going to do after eight years in the army. I was going to go off and I was going to live in Hollywood and like sleep in my car if I had to. But I yeah. was gonna, like I was going to try my ass off to get become an actor and then maybe a lawyer. You know, if that doesn't work That's out. That's so awesome. So, uh, <laughs> so I, I had some, I had some aspirations, some dreams. Yeah. Uh, but then, yeah, but then I also liked martial arts, um, and I liked acting. So like mm-hmm. the combination of the two mm-hmm. was pro wrestling, and so it kind of, kind of draws me to that. And I was like, man, if I could do that, that would be awesome. You know, I like acting, um, and I like being physical, uh, and so that's a, a, a good combination of the two. Right. And so it, it was, it was, it was part of me that wanted to do that. Um, and, and then, so if we want to talk about so martial arts too, yeah, I, I've really liked martial arts basically all my life. I, I really liked it. We didn't have the money for me to do it for a lot, a lot, a lot of my childhood. And then when I got to high school, we started having a little bit more money and then I got my own job so I could pay for it. But I started taking karate and stuff. And then I got to West Point mm-hmm. and, uh, I wasn't a black belt in karate. So I couldn't really get on the karate team because it was so small. At the oh time. wow, that's where you met Major Butte, right? Yeah, he was okay. the he was the leader of the of the of the karate team. Even though he does Taekwondo too, I think he's black, maybe he's black belt in both. I'm not sure, but uh, he was leading the karate side at that time. Uh, and he he didn't let me on the team, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but then uh, and then the next guy didn't let me on, and the next guy didn't let me on. Yeah, it was I was a, so I was a, a junior at the time, and I was like, I'm a, I'm trying out for karate team for the third year in a row. Yeah. And I'm always getting told no. You know, I feel like I'm better than some of the guys I'm sparring, but I'm not a black belt. Yeah, yeah. And then Jason Song comes over from the Taekwondo t- side and he was like, hey, you're a big dude and you're pretty flexible. Uh, do you want to try out for Taekwondo? I'm like, I always thought Taekwondo was kind of like a wussy version. Of <laughs> so I was like, I need those authos. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, oh, they had authos back then. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I was like, I need those authors. I'm tired of being <laughs> tired, tired, of drill. tired of doing drill. Uh, so yeah, I'll come. Pl- I'll come try out. And I beat some dude. Come to find out, he'd been he'd been training with him on their own, his own time. Oh for wow. like a year. And I had never done it, and came over and beat him, and took basically his spot on the team. Oh so my I goodness. Felt bad about it a little bit, but then, you know, I loved it because it was full contact. Yeah. It was. I, I mean, I could use my power, which is something I couldn't do in karate. You just you're just tapping each other. Yeah. And it's about speed, basically. But Taekwondo, I can use power. I can hit as hard as I want. Oh, yeah. You can and punch, so I'm, too. You know, so I start crushing people in Taekwondo, and I'm loving it. No one's built like me and, and does Taekwondo. Right. Uh, so, And then I got really good, really fast training with all these dudes at a really high level. And then I got out of West Point, and I was like, first thing, I was like, no, I'm going to go get into a Taekwondo gym. I'm going to keep this up. Yeah. And I go to a Taekwondo gym. And that was the thing about the West Point team. And we're all about competition, all about the sport. We're like, you know, going hard, training hard, like, doing good in tournaments and then i get out and i go to my first taekwondo gym on the civilian world and i'm like i'm like i'm a black belt and they're like they're kind of weird about that because i'm not one of their black belts and then i watch them spar and i'm like you guys are slow and like you're doing this for like fitness or something yeah you know and so it wasn't serious like i was like you're not, nobody you're serious here so i went to another gym and again i was like nobody's serious about doing about kicking each other you know and no one's so that really like uh so I kind of died off. So I started doing uh, army combatives and started doing, you know, the tournaments there. Uh, but that was kind of off and on. It wasn't really hitting me. You know, I wasn't really doing that much. And then I got, I got the chance to to go for the 
uh, to, to just train. They weren't even like doing a tryout. They were just like, Hey, you know, we're doing this big tournament and you know, I guess it was a tryout actually. Um, but I was an officer. I was a company commander and I was in a rear detachment company commander. So I had a little bit of extra time like during lunch. So I went over to the Fort Riley fight house and trained with the Fort Riley team, not to try to get on the team. It was just, I, I had, you know, the, yeah, I had committed to myself basically. I had gotten really, that's another thing. So I had gotten really far in one of the Fort Riley post tournaments and I got to the pancreation round, which is full body kick your kicks to the body and the head and then open hand slaps to the face. And then all the other rules are just like regular, but it's a one 10 minute round. And me and this dude obliterate each other for 10 straight minutes. <laughs> uh, just I'm, bl- I'm busted up. He's busted up. Yeah. Both oh, so exhausted. And I lost uh, by points, by judgment. And I, but I was like, that is, this is the best thing I have ever done. I was so happy. I was so excited. I was like, yeah, I, I just, you know, hugged the dude. We were both like, great dude. We were like, <laughs> we were like, we were like, we were like so emotional about it. Yeah. Um, and I was like, man, that's awesome. Now I need to do more of this. So I started going to the four like combatives team, like more and more often. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, but then there was a big tournament coming up and I couldn't go because of my work for my job. And then there was, there was a Fort Riley tournament coming up again. I couldn't do that because of, you know, stuff at my job. Uh, and then my coach who is, who's a pro MMA fighter and he had a gym in Manhattan, which I had tried to go to earlier, by the way, one of the biggest regrets of my life as a Lieutenant, I walked to that, I went to the gym and the sign said Optimus wrestling or something like that. It wasn't, and it didn't show like an MMA gym. And I was like, I don't want to be a wrestler. I don't want to wrestle. So I left. That was his gym. Oh, his wow. name. He changed his name later, but that was his older old gym's name. So if I would have walked in that day and actually started my MMA journey, basically when I was like 23, I mean, that would have been awesome, but I didn't. So, but now I'm like 28 and, uh, and he's like, Hey, you know, you, you can't really do this uh, on the army's time. Why don't you do this on your free time on your own time? And I was like, we talking about it. He's like, yeah, you'd be a, you'd come do an MMA fight. And I was like, in a cage, like, like the really octagon punching, like the octagon <laughs> he's like yeah let's do it and i was like well put up or shut up i guess and, uh, okay joe let's uh, give me a fight i guess and he's like okay it comes back like three three weeks later i'm just there training at the gym and he's like hey i got you a fight in in four, four weeks and i was like oh my god wow <laughs> so then i go and I, I do the fight and i win and uh and then you know that that was that felt great and so i, I really i really got i got into it and so it's it's kind of part of who i am now i've had a few fights uh, one, two, lost two. Um, uh, not really that active in competition. I, I'd like to be, but there, I have I have this other job, and and that's kind of the lesson that maybe I'm getting to is that I love the army and I I love to be in the army, but there's all these other things that I want to be too, and I think that's just a lesson of your life that usually people have to come to at some point is that you only have time on this earth to be good at a certain number of things. And, you know, you have to pick those things and what you're going to do. You have to grow up and decide what your career is, what your job is going to be. You know, I, I'm probably never going to be an actor, never going to be a professional wrestler. And I'm never going to be a pro MMA fighter. Not anymore. It's, you know, it's getting too late. You know, I should have got on that train a long time ago. And then if I did, you know, where would I be with my family? You know, we can't be living in a car together <laughs> trying to get my acting career going. So Down have, by the river. Yeah. yeah man. <laughs> but my family, you know, that's, that's another sacrifice. So I have, I have, you know, I have, I have you know, aspirations that I've always wanted to do, but then now I have a family and they have part of it. They're part of it now. And you know, I can't, there's certain things out of reach now that you can't be anymore. And that's something that's hard to do. And that's uh, maybe a life lesson for people is that, you know, that you're going to get, you know, cause I, I left, I, I walked out the Academy. It's like, you know, you know, I'll do all these things, you know, and then I actually got married or I got married to Sarah. She was like, how are you going to do all these things and, and be married? And I was like, I never thought I was going to get married. And she was like, you didn't. And I was like, no, I had no clue that that was ever going to be a part of my life. Yeah. Uh, and then I got married like two years after I <laughs> graduated, but so that was it, unexpected. It came, it came really fast. Um, but there were so many things that, that I had to have to sacrifice to be in the family, to have a family, um, and, and provide for them. And, and you know, part of you, part people may, may think look at that and say, damn, that sucks. Uh, but it's, it's also great because I have, you know, three children and a wife and I've never knew how much I would, I loved to be a dad. 
And it was just something that's just amazing. I love my kids so much. Um, you know, they, they, they're so great. Like I, I teach them things and I get so much joy out of that. And, you know, there's part of me that there's some pain that like, I can't be those things because, you know, I have these attachments, you know, but going, if, if I had to go back and I think about it too, it's like, Oh man, if I walked in that gym earlier or something like that, but none of it has me not having kids. Like I, I, I would sacrifice all that for having the family that I have today. And that's just, and, and so there's, there's commitments that you're going to make in your life and there's paths you're going to go down and that they may close doors for you in some ways. Um, and no matter what people say that like, you know, one door closes, one door opens, Mm -hmm. another door might not open, but you gotta be happy with that, that room you're in maybe, you know? And that's, that's where you, and there's some great things in that room. There's some great things where you're at and there's maybe that's where they, that's it. Maybe that's the direction you're going to be on for the rest of your life. And no, I mean, that's not my life. My life's not over and there's still things that I can do and I can still do MMA on the side and hell, maybe one day I can even get in a pro wrestling ring and do some of that. Or maybe I can do a play on my, on my own time or maybe when I'm retired. So it's not over for me over, right. over there'll always be another day, another tomorrow. I can always push, push off my dreams for a little bit longer, but it's in service to that, that family. And I guess that's another th- part of service. You know, for me, I am in service to, uh, I'm in service to the army and I'm in service basically to my family. And some people might say, well, you're not leaving anything for yourself, but I mean, I, I wouldn't want any, I would, you know, every time that I take something for myself, I always feel bad about it. So I, I want, I want to have the army. I want to be able to serve others and not so much myself. So giving up, you know, giving up some, some, some parts of myself to do that, um, I think is a good thing. Yeah, man, that is, that is deep. That is, I mean, it's deep that, stuff. That is so deep. And it's I think emotional. so many people can relate on that because we're at some point, we're all going to get to that chapter. Yeah. And you don't think about it when you're young. No. When you're like, when you're 22, you're like, oh, I can, you know, this army thing, that's going to be over in a little bit. And I'm going to, I'm going to get into my real career of being a fortune 500 investor or I can, I'm going to drive race cars or, or whatever, but then stuff happens and, you know, you start getting, you start collecting new commitments and you get new mm-hmm. responsibilities. And there are, you know, for a lot of people that there's going to be, and for me, there's parts of you, there's going to want to push off. And, you know, Whoa, I can't do that. I got, I got that indie car job. Yeah. You know, I, I want to be an indie car racer, man. But then you don't know, think about like that, that future could be better. And it, in my case, it is better. You know, I could be an actor in Hollywood, maybe, uh, probably not, but I, <laughs> I, I could, I could be, you know, some guy, you know, out there uh, that never did this, went this direction. And, uh, I don't, I don't want that at all. Mm-hmm. I want, I want Mina and I want Vivian and I want Asher and I want Sarah. That's what I want in my life. That's what I want to be a part of, even though I have so much power so much. There, so there's still part of me that's going both ways, but this is the, the one that I really choose to be a part of. And I'll, I'll, I'll play with these other things as, as for as long as I can. We all can relate to that at some point uh, when we make that transition. Um, and so to, to end on that note, um, do you feel at this point in your life, do you feel, uh, you're successful and what do you define as being successful? So, yeah, I think I'm, I'm, I'm successful. Um, I mean, I've been successful in my job. I've, yeah, I've gotten good ratings. I've, I've done well in every job that I've been given. And, you know, so, uh, so I've, I've done, I've been successful in the army up to this point. There are some setbacks, like, I don't know if you wanted to still talk about it, but I wasn't, I tried to do FLEP. Um, mm-hmm. and I tried for years and years funded legal education program to be in, to be an army lawyer basically and go to law school. Cause that was always a little bit of part of what I wanted to do too. Um, and I tried, I applied for that program and got close lots of times mm-hmm. and I never got it. Uh, and so it kind of felt like, uh, you know, I'd always tried, I always gotten what I wanted. I'd always done, you know, tried real hard and got it. I tried real hard and I didn't get it. Uh, so I, for a while there, uh, that kind of sucked. Um, and then I wanted to be an instructor, uh, teach philosophy at West Point. I applied for 
I applied through that. Took mm-hmm. I went and took my uh, GRE and applied to the philosophy program, and apparently got real close. They told me I got real close, but they didn't take me. So it was two years I applied for that, didn't get it. Wow. Uh, so that's two two failures in that way. But even then, I mean, I was doing really good as an armor officer, so it was still working out. Just all these little small programs, and then I got when I got into actual, I actually got into strategist. I was like, well, I actually. <laughs> I actually applied for something and I got it this time in the <laughs> army. And uh, so that's great, but it's more than that. I mean, I'm successful because I have, I mean, I have a family, I have a lineage. I have someone that's going to, some people that are going to be, you know, live past me and I'm, I'm able to be a part of their lives. And I'm going to be a, uh, someone that they're going to remember. Cause I mean, I think about my parents and how much they, how much they instilled on me. And, you know, I don't talk, talk to them enough. <laughs> I need to call them more, but, uh, you know, and I hope my kids call me more than I call my parents, but they are a big part of who I am today. And I have, and I never thought of it until I was probably like 24 or you know, whenever I had my first kids, I was like, I never thought I was kids one day, but now that I do, I'm like, this is so great. You know, there's so much I'm imprinting on them and, and I can, and then hopefully I'll be successful but seeing them be successful and that's why and and that's always a that's also another thing that's i'm always always worried about is like am i gonna help what can i do to what, what what's gonna happen to them like how are they gonna be successful and they're young they're really young still so it's you know i can't really say too much about what what i can how i can affect them but i'm trying to show them how to be a good person at least and then that that's that's success that'll be success for me in the future now I feel like I'm a successful person. I'm doing well in my job. I have my family's all together. We're all we're all doing we're all pretty strong together. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I feel like I'm a a good person. So I, I have in that way I think I'm a success, successful person because I think in the end if you're uh, if you're a good moral person, then you know whatever you're doing in life, it, whether it be important or not, uh, in the grand scheme of things you just want to, you be the, a good person. And that's something like Aristotle said, you know, all v- virtue is an internal thing. It's something that you do over and over again. So you apply yourself and to be a virtuous person. It's like, I feel like I'm a virtuous person. So I could be, you know, I could be a, a garbage man. Apologies to any garbage men that <laughs> listening. are listening, but I could, you know, I could throw trash away for a living. Mm-hmm. But if I was a virtuous person that gave of myself to other people, um, and lived a good life, then, you know, that's success. And that it is. Success that is. Well, that that wraps up this episode. Uh, I just want to thank you again, Jeremy, for really taking the time to let me be here to have this podcast. We're actually at a good place. Yeah. And uh, if you guys are interested to continue following Jeremy on his journey as he moves forward as a strategist, um, and, and beyond as an awesome father and family man. Um, I'm going to leave his social media down below with your permission, of course. And uh, that's it for the podcast, guys. Thank you for tuning in. If you liked this podcast and you want to hear more, don't forget to subscribe on Spotify, iTunes, and on YouTube. I'll see you guys in the next episode.